Uh, thank you for coming. My name is Rich DeCapua. I'm the Vice President for Academic Affairs at OneClass. Um, we are an ed tech company that specializes in learning, online tutoring, a lot of work with international students, enculturation workshop, a bunch of other different things. But before my time at OneClass, I spent almost 20 years working in higher education at a number of institutions in the U.S. I say in the U.S. because there are a handful of uh, Canadian uh, schools that have signed up. So hello to our uh, Canadian colleagues. Um, I will, I just want to say before we get started um, and thanking for everybody uh, who came and give uh, Andrew and David a time to introduce themselves before we get started. Um, there's obviously a lot going on on college campuses and certainly a lot going on in the world uh, as, of, uh, as of right now. And um, I just want to say, as somebody who was in the student affairs world, uh, a lot of you are frontline folks uh, with a lot of these conversations and things that are happening. Um, and so I wish you well, and, and I hope things are going as well as possible in the environment that we're in now. But also really excited that you took the time to hopefully uh, dive into the issues of academic integrity, really from a very high level. Um, this is part one of three. This is probably the broadest of the three sessions that we are offering for this week to really get some context because it is a topic that not everyone is really talking about either suc either succinctly or, or at all. And we want to give uh, participants the ability to hear some high level thoughts, get into um, the scope of some of the issues. And then tomorrow and Thursday, we get really into some of the practicality of how to make this work on, on college campuses um, and whatever your role is at your institution. But before I get started, I would like uh, David and Andrew, we'll start with Andrew, just to give a quick uh, intro to the group um, would be great. Hi, folks. Uh, delighted to be here. Thanks, Rich. Uh, so I uh, come to this from starting out my career on the enrollment side of the house, and I was in admissions and enrollment for many years on Capitol Hill with George Washington University and the University of Michigan Flint, and then was a dean of enrollment and got involved more in student conduct uh, when I was at George Mason University. But most recently, before joining the Association of American Colleges and Universities, I was vice president at Brandeis University, where I was was both the chief enrollment and chief student affairs officer, so oversaw our entire conduct structure and our student health structure, which I think has a really important interplay, as I think we'll talk a bit about today. Uh, and now for the past two years, I've been uh, vice president with the Association of American Colleges and Universities, which works, as many of you know, across the spectrum on issues of quality, access, and inclusion in higher education, and looking forward to the discussion today. Great. Thanks, Andrew. Hi everyone, uh, I'm David Rettinger. I'm Professor of Psychological Science at the University of Mary Washington and also the President Emeritus of the International Center for Academic Integrity, which means I just made it out. Um, yeah, I served as, for the last two years as the, as the President of the organization and it is an organization dedicated to promoting academic integrity through uh, authentic learning. Uh, I'm a scholar of academic integrity, which is how I got into the, this business in the first place, so I do psychological research on questions of why, when, and how students cheat. Uh, and I'm really interested fundamentally in issues of teaching and learning and how we can promote environments, be that classroom, be that virtual, be that campus, that promote authentic learning because that is what cheating is not. You know, it's not so much, we don't wanna combat cheating, we wanna help students learn. Excellent, and thank you both for making the time. I do have a quick poll for the group, uh, which I will be launching right now. So you should see it on your screen. Feel free to add your two cents uh, with regard to this. Oh, and a lot of increase already coming in, probably why you are in this webinar to begin with. But in terms of context, and really this is a, a conversation between the three of us and anybody who's on, please add in a question. Um, and Andrew, I wanna, I wanna start with you. We've already heard about some of the things that institutions have had to do quickly with regard to the pandemic. Now we've kind of shifted towards, okay, what's gonna happen in the summer and then to the fall. So I'd love to know from your view as a senior level of a major association, what are some of the high level things that you see institutions are doing to prepare for the fall? What does that look like? What are the big changes? And then David, I'd love for you to answer the same question, but with regards to your role as a faculty member, things that you're seeing changing in that environment. So Andrew, with, with you first. Sure, just answering what's going to happen because of the pandemic. That's a short task, Rich. I'll try to 
condense. Uh, you know, I think what we're all seeing across the board is uh, institutions doing uh, massive scenario planning uh, because there's so little in our control. Uh, will we have enough testing? Where will the virus be? How big will the outbreaks be in the region? Uh, so there are institutions, uh, as you've seen, there are the extremes, the institutions that have declared they will absolutely be on campus and the institutions that have declared under no circumstances will anybody be visiting the campus in the fall. What I'm hearing from most institutions is uh, a hybrid where they've got three or four scenarios running depending on where things are. And they are uh, preparing in each of those scenarios to try to adapt. Uh, regardless, all of the scenarios envision smaller classes, envision some mix of students being online and possibly faculty being online because you have vulnerable populations to this virus that will have to be protected. You have students who may be diagnosed or indicate that they have the virus at some point as we ramp up testing. And so they're, for the residential colleges, they're thinking about how they'll move populations uh, into isolation, either trying to keep everyone separate, which I can't imagine trying to keep college students separate, uh, or doing some kind of cohorting that allows you to uh, contact trace and occupy them by groups. Um, but, you know, the, I've, I've seen so much information from policy experts. The folks who I try to spend most of my time talking with are the university presidents and medical advisors who are doctors. So uh, Wayne Frederick at Howard University, I think is a great example of a nationally recognized medical expert who also leads one of our top institutions. And he's fairly confident that we can reopen in the fall if we take a very smart measured approach. That does mean that almost all the time somebody's going to be online. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so you, your lecture classes, you'll divide up. You may do different schedules. There's some really bold thinking like Rhodes College in Tennessee where uh, their phenomenal president has encouraged them to take steps that they've talked about for years. So they're now doing a different kind of summer session than they've ever offered before on campus. Uh, so they're, they're providing opportunities uh, in the midst of the pandemic. Some of the bolder institutions are, are taking this opportunity to think differently. And then you have groups uh, like Kaplan under Brandon Bastide that are, that are offering new models of gap year that really want to partner with institutions to offer some opportunities online to keep students engaged. So you're not losing them if they're deciding not to come to campus yet. So I think all of that is happening at the same time uh, on the, other side, what we're hearing is students don't know what to make of all of it. Uh, and nearly every study that's been done by our association, by others, uh, we are, have great uncertainty around where enrollment will end up being and who's going to show up. Uh, and I'll say I'm also the parent of an 18 year old who is supposedly headed to college in the fall and I would like him out of the house. <laughs> so we are uh, planning for that even as we're navigating this new uncharted territory. Great. David, in terms of uh, the faculty side of it, certainly what would you add in terms of um, somebody in the classroom, the conversations that you've had or um, some best practices that are being talked about right now? Well, I think there is a, a, a the, the first word is flexibility, right? Andrew started by saying that there's a lot of scenario planning and that's what it looks like from an administrative point of view is trying to game out what the possibilities are. From a faculty standpoint, it's, the, it's one step removed. We're trying to figure out Right, what is the administration going to do in response to these data? And the best administrations, and I've put ours at Mary Washington in this category, are communicating constantly about what their thinking is, about what the data inputs are, about what the triggers are for various activities. And you know, those, those institutions that are keeping their employees, and by that I mean faculty and staff both, in connected with the decision process are the ones that are gonna have the best buy-in later. I think that's very clear. And the more top-down and the more autocratic it feels, even though this in the end has to be an executive decision, it can feel very different. Right. And this should not be done democratically, I would say. I'd say you need expert, this is a case where expertise matters a whole lot. From a faculty standpoint, this flexibility translates to, well, terror in a lot of cases, right? We don't, we, you know, so if you read it wrong, it's please prep your class three different ways. Uh, please give me three different versions of the same class. And by the way, we've cut our adjunct budget, so prepare to teach an additional section or two. And by the way, we're doing that on a reduced pay. Mm -hmm. So it's, um, you know, it's, 
not, it sounds like complaining, but it's not, right? Faculty have it better than almost anyone else in the American workforce in a lot of ways. So this is not me complaining, but it's definitely the case that those of us who have been using technology in diverse and interesting ways are looking at this as an opportunity to see how robust those structures that we built are. Um, my own story is I was teaching one class, multiple sections of one class when we suddenly came offline or, you know, out of person or remote, that's what I'm looking for. Uh, and I said to my students, the first thing I did is sent a poll to my students and said, what are we going to be able to manage? Mm -hmm. And their overwhelming response was, the only thing that's going to change is your lectures. Everything else we do uses the, the, the LMS platform, so we should be fine. Um, and we trust you to make sure the lectures will work. And, you know, I hope I delivered. But the lesson there is that there's a huge range in preparedness based on where we were um, you, and the pedagogical techniques we've, we're already using. For some folks, it's a relatively short step to, um, to figuring out how to work less synchronously and more and creating community online. For other folks, it's a very, very long path from where they are to where they need to be. Right. Um, because we, we were surviving in the spring, but in the fall, we all want those things that we want for our students every semester, meaningful learning, communities being built, personal growth achieved, and that's not something you can just change modalities on with the flip of a switch. Right, thank you. Um, so let's get deeper into the realm of academic integrity. And, and before I start, obviously the poll, as I see it right now, 83% of those of the 53 who are participating who, who responded um, say that academic integrity concerns have increased uh, with regard to moving to an online hybrid uh, virtual model. It, we're going to get to that specifically because that's why we're all on. But pre-pandemic, because the use of technology really is a good thing and also fuels a lot of the behavior in terms of, of its ease. And David, I'm going to start it back with you and then go to Andrew after this. In a perfect world, everything runs on technology, being online. What should the model be of students using online resources to be successful in the classroom? If things were perfect, what would it look like? Oh, how much time do you have? Um, <laughs> I mean, the short answer, let me take a step back and say, I don't think that online resources, I don't think that technology causes cheating. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's an arms race and we all use the tools that are available to us to, do the, to achieve our goals for better or for ill. I mean, I'm guessing that monks in the Middle Ages were complaining that the new monks weren't learning how to do all of the you know, illuminations of the, you know, once the Gutenberg Bible came out and this is gonna lead to moral decay. Right, so it has ever been thus that technology leads to change, and people have tr and and that the people, being the students in this case, adopt the change faster than the institutions, and it takes us a while to catch up. This is not an inherent problem with technology; it is just being human. In another, in other words, having said that, we have to catch up. We have to play our part in the cycle. And so, in the perfect world. It has not, the answer to this question has nothing to do with technology. In a perfect world, students are at their colleges or universities with goals that are in alignment with the missions of those colleges and universities, which means they're there to learn the skills, knowledge, mindsets, social experiences, and all those things that the universities are there to provide, that students understand what the goals are, and that society supports this all in the same direction. So we've had this commodification of higher education over the last couple of decades, we've had a devaluation of expertise over the past couple of decades in our society. And our society has also made it really hard to be successful without a college degree. This is not to say a college education. And so once the goals of the students stopped aligning with what we're trying to help them do, then cheating starts to make more and more sense from their perspectives. Mm -hmm. So regardless of technology, our goal has to be to align our goals as teachers and institutions with what students are coming in with. Now that means change on both sides, I should point out. Right. So this has, this has nothing to do with technology. Have, but having said that, when you take a student off the campus, having been on a campus, this is not to talk about online only institutions per se. When you take a student off campus and that, that change is somewhat jarring, those students are experiencing a whole lot of things and we could, t we could spend hours talking about the variables, but the short version is their, their 
can, their goals are somewhat less aligned than they were right away. And their motivations change very quickly. And the, the, the ground becomes more fertile for them to do things that they might not have endorsed a month or week ago uh, before. And so I think that that creates an environment that is challenging for academic integrity. Right. And Andrew, actually, be before you go, if I could add a, a slight twist to maybe your answer, because David really had something that resonated with me. As somebody who teaches finance in higher education, especially the commodification of higher education, I felt a lot, and, and then back to you, Andrew, that there were many, many students and families out there who certainly felt that the total cost of attendance in the spring semester did not equate with the, the product, right, of being moved to online. Um, why am I paying this much? Institutions that, that you know, you were talking about in your first answer of what they're doing um, have had to think about what the cost of attendance looks like. Do you think that issue, that prevailing kind of cost, the commodification, is possibly leading to students thinking, well, hey, if you're putting me online and you're making me pay for this, you know what, I, I, I'm good, and I got stuff going on in my life. I have to now care for a loved one. I have to now work. Um, I, I feel I might have a little onus to be able to take some shortcuts. Yeah, well, you know, I, I want to piggyback on both what you and David have suggested and start with colleges have not done a terrific job uh, explaining their goals to our students. So when you think about the goals of a liberal arts education, and, 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 I, and I use liberal education here in the sense that, that, that AEC and U studies it. I'm not talking about whether they're in a business program, whether in an education program, or they're in a culinary program. It's still the idea that we're training students in how to think critically, how to reason, uh, how to work collaboratively, how to communicate. And those we know are actually in some ways commodified, we, to use your term. We, we have data uh, from Pew, from Strata, from AAC and U that says this is exactly the set of skills that universities, uh, that, excuse me, that employers want most. But when we introduce students again and again to liberal education, when I went on the tours with my son, they said, oh, our general education is terrific. You can take whatever you want. Well, no, that's a terrible message. We're not asking you to take whatever you want. We're actually, at most institutions, extraordinarily thoughtful about crafting a set of experiences in these courses that have a particular set of values. We're trying to, we're not simply making you take these courses for busy work or to check things off a list. We're having you take them because they have substance. They have outcomes that we're looking for. And so when the student doesn't see the outcomes of the class, of the learning outcomes as aligned with their goals, uh, then as David's saying, there's this huge inherent disconnect. So now magnify that by the question that, that you asked, Rich. Now I move to a different format and am I getting the value out? So I've got two disconnects now. Was the class in the first place something that I valued? And is the new format something that holds the value that I feel that I'm contributing to it? And then layer on these, these other factors that we're all facing, the wave of anxiety about what's happening economically, what's happening health-wise, what's happening uh, in racial equity in our society, the questions that I hear from students again and again about teachers and experience with using the platform, with changing platforms. So they're in Zoom and WebEx and uh, they're jumping from uh, to, to Microsoft Teams one after another. And then uh, you mentioned something uh, in there, both you and David, about sense of community. And so uh, you have the idea of shared goals and the goals of the class and the, the value of the format. And then you also have the idea of we are a community in a class and we are a community with norms of behavior. And uh, I, I think, David, what you said is so important. Uh, my experience is that there are relatively few institutions that in the spring, in the rapid transition, spend a lot of time trying to create student community, to maintain student community. And it was left to the individual faculty members to try to do that in their classes. And that's not intuitive for, for many folks, figuring out this new world and how to create that, that communal sense. And so I think we, we lost a step. And it's something that, we, that universities are really gonna have to think about when students are more separated, even if they're on campus, how do we maintain that sense of community? Not just because we've sold it to you as rah-rah and that's the value of coming, 
but also because there is uh, on the academic integrity side, on the social norm side, this importance of being part of something that sets a standard. Excellent. Thank you both for that. I'm going to read you something that was in uh, a very recent Forbes article that was talking about some of the scandals that have hit higher education, specifically at Boston University and Georgia Tech. Um, and again, as I say that, I, I know nothing about those cases and I assign no fault, right? I don't know any of the specifics, but those things are out there. And so Forbes uh, published some results from the Journal of the National College Testing Association. They said, as a result of a five-year study, it could not be more clear. 76% 70, of their student respondents say that they cheat, they cheat often, and even more often online and when they think that nobody is watching. David, as somebody who is an expert in this field, does that statement resonate with you? And if you were to expand, especially about the online, what does that kind of conjure for you? Well, first of all, those numbers sound pretty, the one statement I might take issue with is they cheat and they cheat often at 72%. When you see numbers like 72%, that's, that is the highest of the high range of cheating data that I tend to see. And when you see that number, that's anybody who's ever done anything on the list of things you're, that we would call cheating. And so when you look at students who cheat often, like more than once in a semester even, that number plummets to like maybe more like 15, 20% who are persistent, persistently, let's say misconduct, as opposed to cheating, we use that word. Um, there's mixed data about what, um, whether, um, whether there's more cheating going on online. And I think in particular, what you have to look at is the overall context of online uh, courses. Right? Some online courses are one-offs. Um, some online courses are taken at the institution that the student's enrolled in, and many are taken sort of one-off at summer and in the summer. And so all of those factors that Andrew was talking about in terms of how seriously you're taking your your ethical role vis-a-vis -vis this institution change depending on the context. So lumping the modality in, um, I mean, all, online is too, versa, uh, too diverse a modality and too diverse a set of situations to really give a single answer that's adequate. Mm -hmm. What I will say is that I completely support the idea that if you're disconnected from the institution and the instructor, you're much more likely to, be, uh, to commit misconduct. That connection to the instructor, the belief that the instructor's doing something that's worthwhile with you, that you want that instructor to, um, I don't know, be interested in your work, and you think that instructor is interested in your learning, those are all what we would call um, those. Those are those are mitigators. Those are um, those prevent what we call neutralizing attitudes. And neutralizing attitudes are those attitudes that allow you to do something that you think is wrong. In this case, academic misconduct. It, this class isn't important. My instructor doesn't care. The modality is terrible. Those are the kinds of excuses you might use new, to neutralize something you know is wrong. So when you rush online or when you're online at an institution that you don't care about or when the instruction isn't that good online, which can happen anywhere, um, and it can happen in person, I should point out, then yeah, you're going to see a lot more cheating. But that's not because they're online, it's because online create, it's harder to create community online for those of us that are used to teaching in person. Andrew hit on it perfectly. So yeah, I think that overall, I don't have any major objections to those numbers, but I think I have some quibbles that are important. Got it. Just to follow up on that, on that too, David, because in all of my years doing policy work and especially student conduct work, we're, we're always looking, people like to gravitate towards the sanctioning. Like if somebody does something, what will happen to that person, right? Because that's supposed to signify some type of, you know, value of the institution. But what I'm hearing from you and from what I just know as a practitioner, and certainly um, I want Andrew's take on this, is a lot of this has to do with how the institution positions itself in a relationship with the student. That heads off a lot of problems, not just academic integrity. So mm -hmm. Outside of the sanctioning and policy, which again, we're not going to get into specifics here, but certainly on Thursday during that session, that's what we're going to talk about for the entire time. Um, what are some best practices or things that you have seen where an institution, maybe at your own, a place that you've worked at or, or you know, that the institution does a good job of positioning that relationship? And is there an example of that maybe you've come across in your time? There are a lot of good examples. Um, there are unfortunately a lot more examples. Uh, what I wouldn't say bad examples, but non-examples. 
I say the modal response to it of institutions to academic integrity is none whatsoever. Um, maybe you'll have a quick couple of items about what plagiarism is in, a, in an orientation session. Um, or maybe you'll even have an online tutorial if you're lucky. And then radio silence yep. it, from an institutional standpoint. Um, it just the conversation ends. Um, the best institutions have dedicated academic integrity offices or at least academic integrity staff or faculty um, that communicate um, from the beginning. Um, academic integrity takes a central place in the community ethos, and that doesn't have to be an honor system, but an honor system is a good way to institutionalize that. So whether that means an honor convocation, whether that means talking about it at another opening event. And then the other thing that best institutions do is they don't stop talking about it once you finish your first year, right? So I mean, what I say to my colleagues is every one of us should have a short, meaningful, um, discipline and individual specific conversation about academic honesty, integrity in your discipline and in your class. Um, and if students hear about it from faculty, and frankly, that's um, their main source of information about academic, about academic work, that and their peers, they're gonna, they're, that's a message they're going to hear. Uh, no student I've, has ever in their life said, oh, I saw that blast email and it changed everything about the way I think. Right? They hear about it from a professor, a trusted TA in, the, in some institutions, um, or their fellow students who, when they come in, say, yeah, you know, this, is, this place we take this seriously. So it has to be part of a community culture, and that's built by person-to-person -person communication, not by blast email or websites. Yeah, and I, uh, that's uh, uh, just to piggyback on that, that's exactly right. And that communication element that uh, David was talking about is so critical to institutions. So he talked about with faculty, the importance of the university communicating constantly. And the same goes for students. You know, what we're essentially talking about is the student feeling that the institution is investing in the student. Uh, and so when you're talking about feeling like there's value, feeling like there's relationship, some of the elements are systemic. Is the, are you on a, a, a platform that's working well? Is there access to it? Can the student get a place to study quietly? And is someone worried about that? Is someone worried about their technology, their laptop, their, their internet access? And is anyone reaching out to them trying to make sure that's happening? And then is someone communicating with them about what the university's doing and how they're making investment and what they're doing and then coming down to the faculty member level. And uh, where I've seen this work, Rich, is institutions, and I've, I've talked to a couple of them, where their faculty, uh, I was just talking with Denison University about this, and their, their faculty have been reaching out to the students in their classes. They do their class sessions, and then they're reaching out individually. Now, you know, I, I'm not sure that we could have done that at the institutions I served where we had much larger classes, but the scale that Denison operates at allows their faculty to take that time and they're particularly charged. Their, their mission is around this personal relationship with students. So in addition to what they're doing in class, they're individually reaching out to students proactively, not just holding office hours where the students can ping them, but reaching out to them individually and reinforcing that, that communication flow. And what I saw from students who got that experience was they felt like someone was looking out for them. Multiple faculty were contacting them each week to talk with them, and not always just about the class, but about how things are going and where things were, which again comes to that sense of community building. Right. So, so yeah. my, may, I, may I just add a, a cool little behavioral science piece of data. Um, there, this is work back from, uh, I think from Mac Be Max Bazerman about 20 years ago. They just put a picture of a set of human eyes over um, a cof an honor payment coffee maker in a, in a break room. And the amount of people who paid for their coffee went up dramatically when they just put a picture of a pair of human eyes up there. Humans are social creatures. And so eye contact, in this case, literally, not even metaphorically, literally reduced people free riding in this context. And so z much as we complain about Zoom, and I'm the first, um, making eye contact with someone, even through a computer, will reduce cheating. I know it sounds crazy, but it's true. Um, it, these are the small differences that you can make that will make a big difference. And I'm not talking about surveillance here. I'm talking about communication. Right. So, and actually a, a really great segue, speaking of eyes, 
Um, in a spring survey from Educause, which is obviously one of the biggest uh, technology groups in higher education, they responded, uh, you know, 312 institutions responded. 77% said that they are currently administering or planning to administer take-home tests online with some sort of remote monitoring ranging from human surveillance via webcams to software um, and, and lets a test temporarily take over a student's browser. Uh, I'd like your feedback. Is that where we should be going? Is that, I mean, it, it's, it, it has Orwellian overtones, but I'd like to know what your thoughts are because with everything going online in some type of really scaled way, a lot of institutions will be looking at this to try to curb cheating on campus. Well, I have thoughts. <laughs> I have many thoughts. Um, so I have colleagues in, in a, at the ed tech world who I greatly admire, although I don't always agree with, who would say never, ever, ever, surveillance evil, ed tech evil, don't do this. I have, obviously have many colleagues who use, use these surveillance tools with, to their, in their mind, great effect. I will say two things. Thing one is, Students who are honest want us to enforce the rules. Students are, who are honest become disillusioned when they perceive we as faculty and institutions don't take the rules that we set seriously. They feel taken advantage of. I've seen this time and time again in both data and in personal communication with students. So for us to say, oh, we trust you, go forth and be good, is a lovely thought, but many students feel poorly served if we do that. They feel like we are just letting the fox in the hen house. Having said that, to the extent that we build trusting relationships with our students from the beginning is the extent to which we can allow ourselves to trust them later. And so in the context of a small honor code institution, where as such as the ones that I've worked at, that's very realistic and you can do that and you can to greater or lesser degree, depending on the situation and institution, rely on your students to do what they promise they will do. And you just accept certain amount of dishonesty baked into that because the trust is more valuable than the advantage that's being taken is not valuable. Having said that, um, I saw someone, I had a question, what do you do in the situation where you have 300 students of your own? I, you can't do that. You can't rely on your students to do the right thing. And so then I think then you're relying on structural changes. Um, I think it's safe to assume in the modern world that any test bank that is, has been published, that, it, that at least a reasonable percentage of students have access to it. And so as an example, and so as we move online, we have to be creative and thoughtful about what, what represents exam security in that context. Um, and so it's much harder to maintain security for something like um, a multiple choice exam in any format um, online. Not impossible, but it requires a lot more work. This is a case where you might think about using some of the technology to your advantage, maybe having them uh, create videos that you can evaluate or things like that. Um, you, have to, you have to be creative and you know your situation better than any, any administrator. And so you wanna figure out as best you can what will work in your context to try to create much less harder, uh, much less easy to cheat on assessments, new ways of assessment would, in, co in, in combination with trusting your students as far as you can is what I would recommend. Thank you for getting yeah. that, that question. I appreciate that, David. Andrew. Yeah, uh, you know, it's, it's fascinating from a communicator standpoint, also the question of, of how we address issues of privacy these days. Uh, and I would say one of the key factors as you're thinking about building that community of trust is if you're going to use those tools, having a conversation about it with your students. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I, I would be fascinated. There's a, there's a fascinating research topic for someone here about how students would feel about it. I, I venture to say that the Insta TikTok generation actually feels a little bit less sensitive about uh, the idea of folks watching them as they do things and uh, might be uh, willing to opt in to a lot of these pieces out of a sense of fairness if it was presented right. Uh, and I wanna come back around to the question that was posted around the, the large classes as well and how you build community. And, and much like with online, uh, the, 
obviously the smaller the class, the, the less the teaching load, the easier a lot of these pieces are. But for our institutions, most of which are the ones that I've served where you have larger classes, where you have larger teaching loads, you want to think creatively about where do you have peer advisors or uh, supplemental instructors? And what other ways can you have someone reaching out to create again that sense of contact and that sense of community? Because look, in, in the classes where I've taught large lecture classes, I don't get the opportunities to reach out to those students individually, but I really try hard to have my student assistants or peer advisors or graduate assistants, depending on the format, uh, working to create those small group uh, continuities. Uh, because if you lack that, it's really hard, no matter how entertaining or how engaging the class session itself is, uh, it's, you're, you're losing something if there's not that contact. In an online setting, I, I, I just, I, I have not taught a large class online. And I'm such an, a, a, an incredible addict for student feedback. Uh, I, the idea of having all my students online and not being able to get that immediate sense of how they're reacting to my lecture, got to be incredibly hard. And so that, that opportunity to break down, to have some smaller groups, maybe even as the faculty member to say some of our sessions, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see subsets of you so that I get some smaller interactions uh, may be valuable in terms of trying to create that setting, but surely you want to do everything you can to grab help, again, peer instructors, uh, graduate assistants, or others to try to have still that outreach and contact with your students. Right. So I want to get to a real world example, because in my experience, and especially working in policy and conduct, anytime we talked about academic integrity, there really was kind of the sense of, well, that's, that's a faculty issue. That's an academic issue. They should be the ones that are driving that, that that, that car and you kind of just latch on. But what we found as a, as a company that does online tutoring, right? And we do online tutoring with tens of thousands of students. Once those students started to go online, we saw the need for tutoring decrease and the one-stop kind of homework help questions increase to a point where we had to build our own internal AI artificial intelligence, not academic integrity, to be able to figure out when people were asking for help that we, that, that we know is just inappropriate, right? And then kind of reframe those questions. And I think it goes to, to what you were saying, David, in terms of the percentage numbers, um, you know, there's a small amount of students that will ask for it directly, knowingly, willfully saying, you know, I want, you know, this information, these answers. Uh, more often than not, they are, they are questions that are being posed that infringe and we got to kind of push back. Now with things going online in the fall, I'm wondering, one, if you can comment on that, but two, we're also hearing from our student users that academic support on college campuses has been so diffused and the hours or the, the technique has changed in a bit that it's been difficult for some of them to keep up with what their institution is offering. Therefore, they're coming to, to online means. Um, and so that was a lot, but I'm hoping uh, that's enough just to at least comment on uh, like thoughts on that? Because we're just going to see an increase of that in the fall. I mean, I believe. Well, and, and, and I want to extend academic support to, to just broad, more broadly student support. So we know that there's a tremendous rise in, in students' financial needs, in students' health needs, and, and particularly in students' emotional health needs. So as we, as we already had our counseling centers that were entirely overwhelmed, uh, what does that look like in the midst of students being online? Right. We actually have, have had a mitigating factor uh, in, and, and it's one of the things that universities have to really carefully navigate, but the opening up of telecounseling, uh, both for health and for, for mental issues that was enacted during the crisis, allows students access, and, and it's one of the things that campuses have to kind of gently guide students towards, but to say where you're in crisis, where you're facing things, do you have some network of support in your home area? Because you can still reach out to the counselor you were seeing when you were back home now because you're allowed to see that person through telecounseling. You're allowed to still see your neighborhood, your, your uh, family doctor or your pediatrician. And so there's suddenly an, 
an opportunity for access. And I hope we preserve that because it would take such a tremendous load, whether we're online or in person, off of our counseling centers if our students can maintain some continuity of care with the folks who've given them their, that support. But that other level of infrastructure, your writing centers and, uh, you know, that also often depend on their student help and trying to facilitate all of that being online, your tutoring centers, all of that, I think, has been enormously taxed and stretched. And we are seeing a rise, not just in, you know, in the work that one class does in other companies that do all kinds of different creative online tutoring and, and programs. I think we're going to see that that whole field uh, come back surging because universities are going to need to think creatively about what kind of partnerships create that sense of support. Uh, and again, I think there's a there's a message. If we if if a university can say we realize that our traditional structures of support were insufficient during this period, and here are the things that we're doing. It's hard to talk about investment at a time when. Uh, you're, you're financially strapped, but it, it is an opportunity to invest creatively in your students and, and signal that you realize that they need that support. Thank you. And I'll pivot a little and talk or maybe uh, hone in a little bit on the academic integrity questions uh, that go along with this. When you use support, a student uses support from say a writing center or a tutoring center on campus, this is considered to be a an extension of their educational process. And the people who work in those centers are trained and carefully um, and connected with the faculty through the directors and assistant directors of those centers. Um, and I think that's, from what I understand from you, Rich, that's what one class is really trying to build is a very similar model. Uh, one of the things that that model implies on campus in most cases is transparency. Uh, when I have a student who goes to the writing center, I get a lovely little check sheet from, uh, from the writing center that says, um, Johnny or Susie came to the writing center, we worked on this project, here's what we did, we brainstormed ideas for topics, whatever. That transparency is the key to almost all of these interactions. And so what happens when this moves to the commercial space, online or otherwise, is the transparency disappears and we don't know that a student has gotten help. Right. And so, the difference between, so the, it ultimately comes down to the problem of grading, right? If we, if we just say, if the student's learning, that's great, who cares, that's fine, then the conversation can end there. But once we're expected to evaluate this work as satisfactory or for a letter grade, now we, now we need to know the origin and the process through which this work was created, because that matters a lot in determining what the grade should be. Um, I often say to my students, yeah, you have to do the work because if, I, if you outsource going to the gym, you don't get any healthier. So you have to do it. It's not, I don't care about the paper. I care about the writing of the paper, right? So just the, you don't go to the gym to have the weight up. You go to the gym to lift the weight. And so the process matters a lot. And once you go to the commercial space, then the process becomes murky. Um, I tell students at co honor convocation all the time, you, it's almost impossible to cheat if you tell your professor exactly what you did to complete the assignment. You might have done a bad job, but you probably didn't do anything dishonest if you're completely transparent about the way you did the assignment. So if you wouldn't tell your professor exactly what you did in completing the assignment, then it's probably not within the bounds. So at the end of the day, I don't think this is an online versus in-person problem. This is about an offshoring, if you will, of things that universities can't afford to do anymore. Um, and so we have to do exactly what Andrew said, is figure out where our investments are best placed in order to help our students succeed. Maybe it's not counseling centers if telemedicine will become more effective. Maybe it's in writing centers where the, tele where the telemeetings are, work are less effective. It's hard to say. But this is an empirical question that institutions like the AAC and you are really good at helping us figure out where our resources are best spent. So in just in keeping with time, you know, we are, uh, we have about 15 more minutes. A couple of questions have come in. I have a couple more, uh, but please add those Q&A. And just for folks to know, because some of you have uh, doubled or tripled up on the sessions. Today is the overarching. Tomorrow gets into um, the real academic uh, field of this uh, in terms of um, syllabi, what should be in there. 
uh, folks from Student Affairs talking about some of the things that Andrew talked about. What what is the current makeup of students? You know, there are traditional ways through research of why they choose to cheat, but those things have changed recently. And what are some of the hardships that students are go through that may um, may increase the likelihood that they might do that. And then certainly on Thursday is about policy development. I would love to know from, from the both of you, um, and David, if you were in front of a bunch of department chairs, academic chairs, uh, Andrew, if you were in front of a bunch of people that were in charge of core curriculum revision, because I know that was part of the Gen Ed Conference for AAC and you in, the, in February, and this overarching notion, this topic of academic integrity came up. What would be some of the things that you would be telling these individuals of? You have to look at this. It's important because the best thing you can do is, you know, not one silver bullet, but what do you think some of that content would look like? You touched upon it, but I think a lot of the people who are, are here are looking for, this is all great uh, uh, thoughts. How do I put this to action in some way? Well, I, I talked, when I talked to faculty and, and uh, people who are going to be in the classroom, I, I say that the first line of attack should be a teaching and learning approach to academic integrity. As soon as you're looking at enforcement, and as soon as you're looking at policy, then the, your first opportunity has already been missed. So ask yourself, ask, ask yourself, will your students understand why they're doing the work they're doing? Will the students see the, um, I'm putting, copying and pasting the learning objectives for your course semester by semester into your syllabus is the literally the least you can do. Um, when I used to teach research methods, I would talk to my students all the time about why every single assignment was there. Why are you looking at, at this graph? Why are you conducting this experiment as opposed to, you know, just looking at the research? To the extent that students understand where they are and why they're there, we get back to that um, aligned uh, goals. Uh, and then, so that's step one. Step two is thinking about your assessments. Um, there's lots of good evidence, and I would recommend here um, James Lang's Cheating Lessons as a book on pedagogy that focuses on, that uses academic integrity to talk about pedagogy. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of faculty, and I say this to groups of faculty all the time, who think that get, um, cheating, it, um, it, that I'm suggesting that you become lax or you lower your standards in order to reduce cheating. And I propose the exact opposite. I think that more rigor on the part of the instructor leads to better pedagogy leads to less cheating, period, paragraph, right? If you are doing, helping students space out their practice a little bit to get better retention, if you're giving them meaningful, deep pro, um, prompts that allow them to um, create um, better long-term memory structures, um, if you are giving them control of their, of their assignment choices, all of these things, if you look at Lang's book, you can see the details. Um, all of these things are gonna lead you to a much less cheatable class. Um, che less cheatable because students don't want to cheat, which is the best form of prevention, but less cheatable because it's easier to just do the work. Now, of course, we can talk, and I hope you will in one of the later sessions about contract cheating, where people are wholesale selling um, papers to, you know, and buying papers, which of course is, none of these necessarily solves wholesale. But as a general rule, most cheating is garden variety, plagiarism, and collaboration. And so you can reduce that dramatically by giving students the tools to achieve and to succeed, and more importantly, to believe they can uh, succeed through your, teaching, uh, through your teaching and learning technologies. Your best allies in this context are your uh, in teaching centers, your teaching innovation centers, who can really help us all give some serious thought to what it is that we're doing, especially on the assessment side, to, uh, to help students succeed. Yeah, I, 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 that's exactly right and, and uh, was a lot of what I was going to say, although I'll extend to some of the research that AECNU has, which is as you're talking about your goals in the course and the things you want the students to learn, use the research that's out there that's so readily available. Most of your institutions are members of AECNU. If they're not, they should be. Uh, but use that research that's, that's freely available from AECNU or from Strato or, or many of the other institutions to see that those learning outcomes that you have in your class 
are important for the student's goals. Finding out what the student's goals are at the outset, hearing a bit about that, but connecting that back with them, that these are the things that employers want you to be learning, uh, that, that there are what we call in, in AACNU the essential learning outcomes. And as you're thinking about how to uh, do that assessment that David's talking about, one of the, the areas that I'll steer campuses to is they're thinking not just about individual classes, but about their undergraduate curriculum or major curriculums as a whole, is the, the tools that, that was developed uh, by my colleagues at AACNU along with folks at the uh, at George Q's Center, uh, which is called the Value Rubrics, the Valid, we love our acronyms, Valid Assessment of Learning in Undergraduate Education which has a lot of the elements, the high impact practices that David is talking about, the, the ways of doing assessment based on substantive student work are so important as you're looking to set a platform that minimizes cheating, but also that raises the alignment with those goals between uh, what students are working on and what you're producing. So it's not just, did they learn this particular element of history or in my class, did they figure out how to communicate better, but did what they produced also demonstrate mastery of some of those other essential learning outcomes? And uh, that tying that together, uh, especially in general education courses, produces a lot of positive outcomes, especially if you connect the dots between those learning outcomes and what the students will need both for their initial hire, but also for promotions and for long-term careers. Right. So one more question, then we'll get to some uh, closing thoughts and maybe one more, uh, one or two more questions from uh, the audience as well as when we talk about students who attend colleges, we always talk about, as Andrew had, had mentioned, vulnerable populations. And those tend to be populations that are, you know, first gen college students, uh, socioeconomic uh, lower students, um, international students. And I'd like to touch on that because we have a lot of international students on our platform and from my own time doing conduct work, it was the only place in any of the numbers for data we would run at the end of the year where they would outpace their peers, right? We're talking about student conduct, alcohol, behavior, you know, that was almost exclusively white men, not shocking. Um, but when it came to academic integrity, a lot of our international students were in that realm. Um, and when, when they would go through the process or in my own work with international students on our platform now, there really are cultural differences with regard to how they perceive education. And it wasn't until I went to China myself that I really didn't know this. And like, I knew it, but I, it, it didn't resonate until I was in those classrooms talking. And we don't have a lot of time, and this could obviously be a whole other session, but these vulnerable populations, international students with academic integrity, it seems to be something that faculty members are uh, especially concerned about. Well, yeah, I think they, and, and well, they should be because uh, to go back to part of what David said, a lot of this has to do with expectation setting at the outset and setting bounds of a community. Uh, you know, I tell the story when I'm working with international students about one of my first trips representing universities. I was in Korea navigating partnerships with institutions there and uh, had the incredible opportunity to meet with a, a president and his cabinet at the president's home, which I was told was very unusual in getting this distinctive honor. He hosted a dinner for all of us. It turned out the reason the dinner was on his, at his home was because he was under house arrest. Uh, for having embezzled from that university and was still president of that university. That's uh, the webinar. The next webinar will yeah, be... Yeah, that'll be the next one, how to. So, uh, and I say that not, not as a knock on, on culture, but as a highlight on the, the differences in the messages that the, that the students receive around what are, what are normative behaviors and what are acceptable, what is plagiarism and, and what is acceptable. So uh, one of the values that I, I have, have seen in, in preparing my students at each institution as they came in was incredibly important that we're not saying to them, here's what you're going to have to do uh, because this is what we consider right and wrong. Mm -hmm. But one of the ways that we've, we've often framed it is, it's really important to understand the culture that you're moving into and some of the distinctions 
in some of the areas that, that we value and, and what we're trying to teach and why these things are so important in the way that we teach. Because the teaching structures are often different. Uh, it's not just that, that we're uh, layering on what we consider a different moral value, but we're looking for, in this concept of liberal education, different learning outcomes than in other systems. And, and providing that context has so much value, especially when it's put into a context that these are, and, and I'll, I'll use a, a much too much use instead of essential learning outcomes, but 21st century skills that we're trying to help you be adaptable, desirable to the workforce of the future. And so learning that in this context, it, it takes out the element of our culture is better than your culture or this is superior, but instead, this is a style of learning that we've adopted because we want you to gain this set of talents and skills. And so we're gonna ask you to conform to this operating system, so to speak, to this set of communal behaviors because they're tied in to those learning outcomes that, we're, that are, are the value in being part of this system. Exactly. I'd agree with almost all of that and, and add a little bit uh, first, first of all, when we say international students, it's often really code for students from China and sometimes India. So let's, let's call it what it is. No one is saying, wow, those students from the UK are really having so much trouble adjusting to our style of learning, right? So let's, let's be honest with ourselves about the conversation that we're having. There's some great data from Australia, from the Austra um, a huge national survey of Australia, 50,000 students. And one of the things they found is that there wasn't really much effect of international status over and above things like language facility. One of the biggest challenges we face, and so having said that, I don't agree with that data set. I think I'm much more likely to agree with Andrew that there are some really important uh, cultural differences, especially coming from communitarian versus individualistic societies, um, especially uh, societies with a huge, with a um, more of an emphasis on respecting of elders. That's where uh, citation, come, citation issues come from. And these are, by the way, academic misconduct issues, not cheating issues. None of these students think that they're doing anything dishonest and wouldn't want to be doing anything dishonest if they, if they knew. Having said that, and um, so let me just say that I think language um, issues lead to self-efficacy problems. And in English, that just means that students don't think they can do the work. And when students don't think they can do the work, they're much more likely to try to circumvent the work. So that's a, a huge psychological sort of factor. The other huge psych, uh, psychological factor is one that I've alluded to before is the neutralizing attitudes. Why are students at your university? Oftentimes, the, um, many of our students have extrinsic goals. They want to get good jobs. They want to um, make their families happy. All of these sorts of good things get into graduate or, or professional school. And this is often more so true for students who leave their home country to study someplace that is perceived to have a more prestigious educational system. So it's not that these students as international students, it's not, nothing about their culture per se, it's that they are the self-selected or family-selected students who are more driven by extrinsic things. And therefore they are at more risk of dishonesty irregardless of where they originally came from. It's, it's you know, this possibility that, that people who immigrate voluntarily may have more of an entrepreneurial spirit. Um, it's a self-selection sort of, it's a piece of self-selection data. Now there's no evidence to support that. Let me be crystal clear about that. Um, but I think it's, I think if you, it is after the fact evidence that when you survey international students, they, they score higher on things like neutralizing attitudes and extrinsic motivation. Uh, and, that, and that I think is the root of a lot of these issues. It's not necessarily inherent in being an international student, but the sample of international students who we get at, um, at, in the US and in Australia as well, and in Canada too, I should point out for sure, um, is often st are students who are at high risk because their language skills, because their neutralizing attitudes, because their extrinsic motivations all line up with what we know about uh, risk factors for academic integrity violations. Right, thank you. Um, and we only have about two minutes left. I'm going to ask each of you to say, uh, or, or to say to the group, um, if there was one thing you would hope that they do with this information that they got during this hour, what would that be? Um, either for a faculty or an administrator, but just two points of data 
going back to um, the Educaz uh, survey and the article about the uh, online monitoring, um, as Andrew had brought out in terms of the haves and the have-nots of students, there are a number of institutions, uh, notably uh, UCAL Berkeley, that has banned online exam proctoring, concerned that poor and rural students lack sufficient access to high-speed connections and compatible laptops. Um, going to what uh, David had said, uh, that research from the Journal of, for the National College Testing Association ended with, a recurring theme in the current literature is the importance in teaching and learning environments of building relationships with students and holding discussions with them about academic integrity issues, which I think really summarizes a lot of the big ideas that you were having. So as we end it, if there's one thing you hope that participants would do with this information, what would that be? I would say teaching and learning. Academic integrity is best addressed as an issue of teaching and learning, and I hope all of you will take that back to your campuses. And 1A is consider joining the, uh, the International Center for Academic Integrity. I'm not beyond making that pitch, academicintegrity.org. Uh, there's a huge number of great resources, including um, our assessment guide. Um, we're gonna be looking to do a very big survey on this topic coming, uh, rolling in and around January of next year, and we hope you'll all consider uh, institutional participation. Thank you. Well, and obviously all of your organizations should also join AACNU. So just be part of everything at a point where everybody's cutting back. But I, I think that that message of, of value just stands out to me. Uh, and, and I think it's one we wrestle with in, in higher education so often. We feel like using terms like value, uh, to use a term that you used early, Rich, I think that's, that's actually pretty alienating to a lot of us on the faculty when we talk about commodifying higher education. When we use terms like value, when we use terms uh, like a career, uh, we feel like we're somehow diminishing liberal education. But I think one of the great visions that our, our president of ACNU, Lynn, Lynn Pascarella, talks about a lot is that, that these are not issues of tension. They're actually quite well aligned. And so the opportunity to talk about the investment in your students, of your time, of your energy, the campus making uh, investments, I think we've got to resolve the issue you raised, Rich, of, of, of access. We have to partner with uh, corporate America and others to find ways to make sure that students, no matter where they are, at not only the higher education, but the secondary school level can get this access so that we're prepared for the next disaster. But at the same time, that sense in this immediate crisis of how we're giving back to our students, of what we're doing for them, of even if they're online, that they're still ours, they're still part of a community, which goes back to that community setting that David started us with. Uh, if, if you lose that sense that you are part of a community, then everything else becomes harder. And in, in this uh, lens, particularly uh, that, that problem of setting expectations for academic integrity. Thank you both. Well, on uh, behalf of one class, uh, we are very excited that you all were able to attend part one of Academic Integrity in a Post-Pandemic World. Um, it's been a great conversation. Uh, Dr. Flagel, Dr. Rettinger, thank you so much for taking your time. Uh, we will be sending out a survey, and certainly I think anybody, uh, especially Andrew and David, would be open to any um, communication from anybody who's been on this webinar if they have uh, some uh, some. Uh, uh, independent questions specific to their institution, but come back tomorrow where we'll talk about the academic side of classroom building with some experts, and then on Thursday in terms of policy building. Uh, thank you all for coming. Hope you have a great rest of your day. Take care. <laughs>